Good afternoon and bona iswa sifiwe. Welcome to our session today. This is week 11. We are looking at Ephesians chapter 5 uh, from verse 22 to chapter 6 up to verse 9. And our topic for today is the gospel in relationships. Uh, let's pray as we begin. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so much grateful for your word. We come to you with open hearts. Would you please speak to us? Amen. In the previous chapter of this application part, we have been looking at what it looks like to walk as those who have been made new in Christ in various aspects of our, our whole lives. Paul now takes another shift and focuses at various relationships in the body of Christ that makes the church and this was originally written, of course, to the church at Ephesus. Most of our Christian life is lived in terms of relationships. <coughs> Sorry. It has, it's as well saying that a life in Christ is all about getting relational with other people. And Paul has labored to put basic relationships that reflect a life of a heart transformed and led by the Holy Spirit. Husbands and wives, wives and husbands, parents and children, children and parents, masters and slaves and slaves and masters. Every relationship has expectations and interestingly, we are not free to do as it pleases for ourselves. That is to say, regardless of the relationship under consideration, the manner in which that relationship is carried out is with respect to God. Now, every one of us has experienced either of the mentioned above relationships. Before actually talking about the specific relationships, Paul starts with verse 21 saying, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, which is um, going to govern all the relationships that he puts down. Let's dive in. We will be reading in portions as we continue. And the first relationship is between wives and husbands. I read from verse 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as christ does the church because we are members of his body therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is profound and i am saying that it refers to christ and the church however let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband we see a wife here in verse 22 uh, to 24 and also verse 33. A wife that follows Jesus, she's called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. Husband as well is called to love his wife and use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. This kind of marriage is actually the one that reenacts the gospel a story. The husband's action may make Jesus and his love and self-sacrifice be seen, and the wife's action may make the charge which allows Jesus to love her and make her new. Now in these 10 verses, I want to, us to see the emphasis the church is echoed by Paul, perhaps uh, to that so that the believers in Ephesus may not just think it's about them and marriage statuses, but that they may understand the place of marriage and how it's ultimately the place of showcasing the gospel. At the beginning of the letter to Ephesus, Paul says that in the gospel, God is making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan 
for the fullness of time in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Right in the middle in 3, 1 to 12, um, which sets the context for what we are learning in this chapter's portion talks about the mystery which is the gospel. Quoting from Genesis 2, 24 in verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. We clearly see marriage coming in the picture and the permanence that it is coming with seeing how these two leave their father and mother to hold fast to one another an implication of a lifelong commitment a place of no return the mystery long hidden is now public human marriage points to god man and his girl that before time marriage was predestined to be a physical showcase of the gospel christ loved and loves the church because it is his own body in the same text paul draws a parallel between the normal love we have for our bodies and the love christ has uh, for his church just as we show a proper love for our physical condition by taking care of ourselves so christ shows love for his own body the church by nourishing and cherishing it we see verse 28 and uh, to 30. Uh, and at the end we will see paul asking the ephesians to pray for him that Words may be given to him in opening his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel in 6 uh, verse 16. The other relationship that he looks into is uh, children and parents. I read chapter 6, 1, 2, 4. Um, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment we the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the display and instruction of the Lord. Paul looks into the relationship of the children and parents, that children are to obey uh, them in the Lord for it is right. So what does obeying mean really here? It is an action or virtue of being, of doing that which is right and that is pleasing unto the Lord. This obedience actually means children are to do it uh, is devoted service to God. There is also a call to honor which means to esteem or to fix value uh, which is the disposition with which we carry out the duty of obedience. Honor is the ultimate respect shown. Come to think of an obedience that will yield a promise. Sounds really interesting and, and enticing. But for the believers, just as those in Ephesus, they were well reminded that there is a place they were hoping for. And for all believers, the ultimate promise is life with God eternally in the land. If we disrespect or fail to honor our parents, it is the same as we disrespect and fail to honor our God. Because... This is a reflection of God glorifying relationship as a result of the gift given to us in Christ. Paul is writing to Ephesians Christians. He is telling them to obey and honor their parents. But the counterbalance is fathers not to provoke their children to wrath or engender bitterness. Respect begets respect and honor receives honor. Now there is a tendency of struggling and wanting to put this obedience into our own terms, especially if our parents are not believers or not leading us into the godly ways. But I always give a disclaimer here that the Bible is clear on obeying our parents in that which is honorable to God. A parent who asks us to do things that do not please God, we are biblically right to help them see in all honor that which is not godly. This is where now our honor and respect is tested. Mm -hmm. May we rely on the Holy Spirit to to continue producing a fruit of honor and respect. You know, we are always concerned about when these parents, children, obedience and honor goes away. But I pray that and, and trust that God who teaches us in all manner of obedience uh, will be Lord over us. We may not so deeply and practically understand fatherhood and motherhood by all means um, we are singles but grateful to god who has given us the scripture which is rich enough to equip us to becoming better fathers and mothers if it happens one day
the other relationship is um, between bond servants and masters. And I read from verse 5 to verse 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people please us, but as bond servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whether whatever good anyone does, this is he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Now in the day this was written, slavery uh, was rampantly in and was just part of the lifestyle. In the early church, the slavery and masters would attend the same church. And Paul was deliberate in talking about these relationships. A dear call to servants to obey the earthly masters as they would unto the Christ, not only when they were watched, but a consistent way of serving as those doing the will of God. A deeper reminder also to the masters to do similarly as the slaves were asked to observe and particularly on how they treat the servants and stop threatening them. Did you know a threatened servant will never perform a task as it should because they are always afraid of the reaction of the masters when they come. But for the master, his attitude must be, I will answer to my master for how I treat my servant. I honor my master when I honor my servant that there is no partiality with him. So then what do we learn from these uh, teachings of this portion today? Is I have three points to look into. And number one is that in a marriage setup, there is a call to selflessly consider the other as Christ has sacrificially done for sinners, setting us an example. There is one, there is more to marriage than we have ever thought and seen, for it represents the permanence of a covenant looking forward to an eternal marriage between Christ and the church. May we look forward to that eternal marriage. And the next uh, thing, number two, is that our motivation as children to obey our parents should be the new life we have in Christ and not on any other promise apart from that which as believers we hope for, Christ's return, that we all look forward for not on the basis of our obedience and honor to anyone, but on the basis of what Christ has done for us and in us, causing us to live in obedience. And number three is that we are relational human beings, just as believers in Christ as those in Ephesus who needed to hear this. Let us learn to relate with each other as unto him, because all of us await and are subject to him as our master. Whether working as apprentices, staff members in our placements, and have our team leaders, they might be good or bad, but may we be found to be diligent in our service with sincerity of the heart, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, who alone has a just reward with no partiality. And in conclusion, I say, that the most important implication of this portion is that keeping covenant within relationships context is as important as telling the truth about God's covenant with us in Jesus Christ. Husband and wives, parents with children and servant with masters relationships are not mainly about being or staying in good terms. It's mainly about telling the truth with our lives, our obedience, our honor and our submission. It's about portraying the pure truth about Jesus Christ and the way he relates to his people. It's about showing in real life the glory of the gospel. Let's believe and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We ask that you will help us, particularly on a holistic understanding of marriage, and how it is a reflection of the gospel. As those who desire that one day you would be pleased to entrust us with households, grow us even 
on how we will bring up the children in ways that seek to honor you. Help us, Lord, on how we treat our parents, how we view our leaders, our mentors, and on our placement leaders, not because they are worthy, not because they are good at how they handle us, but because you have called us into a selfless life as one body in the church. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>